recorded just in time for me to have a seizing attack. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying, uh, yeah, and I, I told Jonathan because we were working on it this week. Um, what I got to work was um, an automation where you could create a, a trove. For example, I made this one here on design science, a primer. And then um, there's a button that says sync with GitHub. And if there's not a new GitHub file, it will create one. And if there is one, it will sync. And what this does is it just writes the data into a JSON file, which has all the elements and then the connections in the trove. And then all you have to do is go to Kumu and hit import and put that link. And then it will generate this, which is basically a Kumu of like your whole trove. And you can cluster by like the element type or so this is, these are um, different transformational communities. So right now it's clustered by type. Um, you can also cluster by like location. So this is showing, for example, if I wanted to click New York and focus on that, these are all the different ones in New York. Um, and then you can also um, cluster by things like the subtypes. So plant medicine communities, spiritual and healing communities, retreat centers. Um, and then these are all pulling the information from like the title, the image, description, um, and the URL. So if you double click on these, it'll open them up. So it's almost totally automated. I messaged the Kumu uh, Slack group to see if you can create a new Kumu project with their API and they don't have an API, so you can't do that. But what you can do on Kumu is you can fork a project. So if you um, create a Kumu template, for example, I could take this right here um, and fork it and it will make kind of a copy with all the settings. And it takes a second or two, but then gives you a new link. And then what you could do with that is just um, hit import, um, unlink the old URL. And then with the same settings, you can just import. Uh, it's called a remote JSON map. If you import, then um, this is the, the one that I just generated. This is the design science primer. So this one shows the, um, the different resources, topics, and then the connections between these. So for example, this is a book by Bucky Fuller, Explorations and Synergetics. And there was a connection made that saying that this um, exploration book uh, discusses synergetics. Here's the node for synergetics. Um, so yeah, this is basically something I've been yeah wanting to do for a while. And finally, Jonathan um, <laughs> gave me the energy to actually go into the detailed enough mode to get it to work with all the uh, JSON technical Kumu nonsense. It's gorgeous. Congratulations. Thanks, Pete. If anyone wants a uh, database they have turned into a Kumu and um, the cool thing is it, is it syncs. So if you just click that run button, it'll just update it. Um, so you know, manual needs to like copy and paste into a Google sheet anymore. So yeah, if anyone wants a, um, a Kumu graph of some database they have, uh, let me know. I, I missed the very beginning. This looks amazing. And, and uh, what, what kinds of databases can you work from? Just any, I mean, can it be in? Uh, so it could be any, really any date, it could work with any database, but I would just work with you to format it in the right ways. It, I actually, so initially I thought it was going to be limited to um, a graph database. So, or like a table that had a list of edges and a list of nodes or a list of objects and connections. Mm -hmm. But what Kumu allows you to do is uh, generate connections based, uh, they call it clustering. So, and if you have a, just a list of people, 
and those people have a list of countries in, in another column, you can cluster by location, which means that it will automatically generate the connections between location, like um, all the locations, it'll generate an object for them and then it'll show the connections to all the people. So you can actually do it with one database that just has a list of like, you know, drop down fields and still have the connections. You don't actually have to do it from a, a database of how things are connected. Um, so really it could be any it could be any database um the main fields i have right now are the type so um these are things like project topic post resource um the locations uh sectors and then um subtypes um but what i would like to do is create and if anyone has um a sort of desire to like have a certain view what you could do in kumu is create different different views so um this is like a dark mode view which has some slightly different settings um so you can create different views which have different filters and different connections highlighted by default so like you can also say like you know create one view where it's like clustered by location and create another view where it's clustered by um type or something and then you could change the settings for each of those views which is kind of cool um and then when you fork that project all those views will be there so you can kind of have like a template which has like some like five or six different views um so yeah and the in your i'm just wondering in your um your uh element type location sectors and subtypes are those uh, in, in a given instance, could those be changed, say, to, well, to something? Could a tag field be added or could one of them be changed? I mean, I, I assume the names of them could be changed in different contexts, but could you add to that or is that? Yeah. You know, once once you have the the Kumu here, then you have your own fork of it, and you could change the settings. You could change how these things are uh, displayed or named. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, they have an editor where, um, like, if I wanted to change locations to be like countries, mm -hmm. you can do that, and it won't affect anything else. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you wanted to add another attribute, if you had another column in your you know the database or, or spreadsheet that you were working from you could do more but, or that would be a bigger deal um so what i what i'm working on is um so here's like an example of um i have a so in this trove let's see if i can pull it up um So this is a list of transformational communities. Mm -hmm. And um, what, I, what I'm doing is I'm inheriting, I'm inheriting defaults from the catalyst schema. So for example, if one of these, um, like Kirpalu Yoga Retreat Center, which is in Massachusetts, um, this doesn't have an image. So in the visualization here, um, it's going to just pull the image from the data type. So for example, this is a this is the icon for a resource, which is in that schema I shared. And so it'll pull that image instead of having a, just an empty one. Um, another thing you could do, for example, I have a database in Catalyst of every like country and also US states with images. And so, um, when you generate a new trove and you tag things with locations, it'll automatically import all the locations and then it'll it'll pull in the um, the data from those locations. So you don't have to manually like find a flag and like import like you're kind of using a preset database of like all the countries. And so this is like the ID of the location in Catalyst and here's the image of Ecuador that I had selected. And so um, there's a lot of like cool stuff you can do with inheritance. Like these are the um, the sectors 
where it's pulling the color and the the image and the title for the sectors. So it'll do a lot of like automated beautifying of the database. Um, but that is using like preset fields, like location, sector types. So that sort of stuff, you can always add like other fields, but that's gonna, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a different um, project, I guess. Right. So like, I think something like Akumu where you would wanna completely customize it, would probably be best just doing it yourself. Um, but something where you want to be able to like automate it and also that there are like common fields that you wanna be able to like pull information from without having to manually get images for every country. Um, that's kind of what I'm designing it for specifically. Yeah, I'm honest, honestly, I, I'm, thanks for that, that answer, which was more than, <laughs> that's great. Um, I, I, I was just thinking like, Hmm, you know, tags, just flat out tags seem like something that would be useful to, like if you had a trove and you just hashtag some stuff. And oh, yeah, tags are, hmm. tags are one of the like recognized types. That database just doesn't have tags. Like nothing has okay. tags, okay. so it doesn't show it. Yeah. Okay. So to translate Michael's question into my language, uh, you can cluster by tags. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Well, I'm sorry <laughs> if I didn't ask that in a clear enough way to elicit such a <laughs> concise answer. <laughs> uh, very cool. Hi, Yuri. Oh, you're, you're, on you're on mute. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, right, very nice. I uh, that that Kumu stuff. Yes, yes, yes. I think that's. Uh, that would be really right up like your alley. Huh? A, th a thing we could talk about um, that I don't really want to uh, is um, project management uh, over in Mapweavers. Uh, Vincent and I are having, I well, Vincent and I have have uh, two opinions, and they're both good opinions <laughs> about whether there should be one database or we should try to make uh, lots of databases at 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 the first. The steady state in the future is going to be lots of databases. Yes. So I, I think I feel, so Vincent is like, dude, it's much easier if we just keep one database because you've got a bunch of stuff pre-populated into it. And then my thing is, but people are going to want to be using different bit databases and we have to get good at syndicating the data between them. And I kind of feel like we should start, start right away. So let me show you something else. Um, so this same issue with a different set of data came up for me just today. And, and I think I have a more strong opinion about this one. Um, so um, uh, Jordan was talking about um, an MVP, he called it, of commitments. Um, so this was me starting to work out a schema for commitments. Um, and thinking what through MVP really means. So this would this would be a great uh, additional table in actually the same Mapweavers um, uh, base. I feel like a better way to do it is is actually I care more about the commitments being published than I do having them stored. If that makes sense. So what I was thinking is again MVP. It's like just make a post to uh, you know make a post to a channel called commitments or something like that, and it's got uh, who made the commitment, um, who is who uh, is the commitment to, um, start and end, and you know how it how it worked out. 
and then there's other things that are nice to have like a short name would be nice um, which project it's part of would be nice um pete could you give us an example of what a commitment would be uh yes and and right there actually it's thanks thanks vincent that's an excellent question and also a reason i kind of think so i think the way to do it I have a, a stronger opinion about this one that the way to do it is to start doing it in uh, semi structured text, basically, so that people can actually make mistakes or innovations on the fields, essentially, and and change the, the, the you know, change the schema on the fly until we like it. Um, so um, uh, I have an odd example. Uh, it kind of stuck in my head and and Jordan's head. It comes from the OGM call. Uh, Stacy said, "Hey, Peter Jones has been asking. Um, he he's, he's absent a cell phone and needs one, um, and it would be great if the community could rustle up a cell phone and get it to him." Um, uh, so Jordan Jordan picked that as an example of something you know, theoretically and kind of structurally kind of simple that the community could do. Um, and, uh, uh, and declare success, right, when Peter Jones actually has a cell phone in his hand. So even during the call, um, uh, John Kelly, you know, raised his hand and said, Hey, I've got a couple of cell phones lying around, let me know, um, you know, who, who I, where I should send it. Um, right after that stacy and i had a call just just she and i and she said a thing i need to do is figure out what john kelly's email address is because i don't know it and i said oh i have it right here and i can just give it to you so to break that down into commitments um uh uh john kelly um uh john kelly uh to um, <laughs> to anybody, this is an interesting case. Uh, John Kelly said, "Hey, I'll give my cell phone to whoever needs to get it to to uh, um, Peter." Um, so maybe this was anybody in network or something like that. And you know, it started on uh, yesterday, and I happen to know it got fulfilled. Well, actually, no, it didn't get fulfilled. Um, uh, so I'm going to write a little bit extra here. Uh, I promise to, this is, uh, you don't need to say I promise to every, every time, right? Or I commit to, maybe is a better way to do it. Uh, I commit to, uh, send, uh, one of my spare cell phones to an address in the US provided to me. And so that's active as soon as he said it, and it's not related to a project. Um, so sorry, this is in text, and hope you hopefully you can kind of follow along with the, the field. Yeah, I, I would change the word project to the word promise or commitment uh, or description. Project, project is actually in what I my intention for that was um, is this part of a, a project that's running? So oh, is it oh, is it I part see. of Massive Wiki? Uh, is it Massive Wiki has sub projects like? Um, I, I uh, get you. It's, creating... it's sort of it's a cluster. Yeah, except it's actually a project is bigger than a cluster. Um, sure. Uh, yes. It's actually uh, it's something that's that's already in the um, Mapweaver's Catalyst. Okay. So project. I asked the I asked the wrong yes. question. Uh, I I wanted a wanted to know if there could be a specific field that is what the commitment is about, what the promise is, what the responsibility is. Those are um, equivalent notions in my mind. 
uh, is that different from this? It is it is the same as that. Uh, so you need another one of these, or well, you need me to that, call this that's, something? That's an input, and it goes into a field that I'm trying to name separately from the names you have there. Add, add one field to the scheme because I'm. Con I guess I'm confused. Yep. That's yeah. I just I, I just had this one implicit in my head. Okay, um, cool. It was in mine too. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Good catch. Um, there's another one which is. I'll probably just name it URL, um, uh, which is. So now I've kind of messed these up. I think short name. I, I left off short name, commitment from, commitment to, description, and then so date goes after description. Um, um, so, uh, so then a URL might be. Uh, A URL might be to a longer, a longer blog post or a, you know, a, a wiki page or, or something okay. or you know, a, a page yeah. with more details. For of the description. Yeah, okay. or maybe a like a whole project plan um, just for this, you know, okay. this commitment. Um, so then another another commitment that happened real fast was. Um, uh, Stacy made essentially a request for guidance, um, but she didn't even express it that way. She just said, I need to find the phone number for John. Um, and I was able to make a commitment really fast in answer to that. Hey, I, I commit to uh, giving you the, the email address. And then, you know, 20 seconds later, she had the email address. Um, but that's another commitment too. Um, I, I probably don't need to write that one out. Um, so, so, so part of this, this is another instance of do we do we start with interchange or do we start with a central one central database um, or do we do both? <laughs> um, I think it's just a timing. It's a timing thing. My my opinion is um, I agree with everything that you mentioned in the call in the Matt Weaver's call about like wanting to make sure there's not a like um just a single like source and that we yeah. have like good federation but I and I think we've been um at our own detriment doing more of that thinking like I think we have more effort in creating federated databases than we actually have one good database so I think we should get better first at creating one decent database that we actually are using before figuring out how to syndicate between bases that don't yet exist. Um, I have the, I, I, it makes total sense. And I love that. <laughs> and I have the complimentary one, right? Which is, um, I care so much that we're, we federate that um, I would start with federation first and not even worry about the databases. And it's easier for me to say that with, with the project, it's actually, I'm kind of on the fence because it's really important to have, to be able to, to like, but, but these are a little bit more atomic. So I'm like, you know, don't even worry about databasing it, just start the transmitting these back and forth. Um, Stacy's got a good question in chat, you know, does one block the other one? And they don't, they actually synergize really well. The problem is doing both at the same time reduces the total energy for either one of them. So to Vincent's point, you know, worrying about how we're going to uh, do the interchange, all the time that we're, we're spending thinking about that is not time that we're building a really good database. <laughs> But, but my point is the opposite kind of, which is as soon as we start thinking about a centralized database, we're digging a hole for ourselves that we're gonna have to have a really hard time to, to claw our way out of, to make sure that we decentralize. And um, I think so even if you start with two and, and you're swapping between them, which takes a, a ton of extra energy to Vincent's point, um, you've, you've at least promised, you've, you haven't started to accrue the, the technical and design and structural and um, effort debt that is going to get you out of that centralized well of gravity wall kind of 
Well, I, I can see why Vincent might be keen to go his direction because data is falling through his fingers and he wants to put it somewhere. Yeah, I, I it, it's, um, uh, it's, it's even more sharply focused than that, right? It's like, you're not gonna be able to see the shape of the data that you want until you have a database. Um, mm -hmm. So when I say, let's not worry about the databases, let's start just throwing rows at each other. It's really hard to see the shape of the database and the schema in multiple instances of random rows that are kind of flying around that don't end up in a database. I'm with you, man. I, I well, love. I I'm I'm arguing Vincent's point and not mine. I, I disagree with that, or I, I have a uh, you know okay. a, a directional preference um, to throw the data question, around. Pete? Yeah. So what is the? I guess I feel like there's um the question is what is the worst thing that could happen? I guess in terms of like. Um, at what, from my perspective, if we have an air table, right, with data, that data could always be exported and put into other places. And so for me, I don't see what the worst case scenario is. Like before we have a task list of like, with like 20 the, tasks. The worst, the worst case scenario is that we get comfortable. Well, I, can I articulate that? Um, and programming you have the same problem do you design it first or do you code first to see what design needs and sometimes it's not possible to decide in which case but if the the bad thing that can happen is you paint yourself into a complexity that is hard to untangle if you want to change something about it uh, it's it's just this one is a little bit different. It's actually uh, you paint yourself into its simplicity that is hard to paint yourself out of. And yes. simplicities are harder to get out of than complexities, actually, um, which is why I feel extra careful here. I, 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 I also kind of want to acknowledge or something that me continuing to, to poke this, it's almost like scratching an itch or something like that, it's like over and over and over. Just it's making the itch worse. We could just get going. I think, and I think the answer is, I, I think maybe the centralized project database is the right, right thing to do. Um, I think with the commitments, whether, I, I think I would just start doing the commitments in interchange format, uh, CSV or JSON um, or maybe YAML. Um, and then Vincent is gonna go, I, you know, I, I, I think we should track these instead of just seeing them pile up <laughs> in the channel. So Vincent is going to like uh, Airtable the thing and then, you know, and then he can export whatever, whatever those in nice, nice report formats. And, um, but I think also what might happen is the, the fields might change or our understanding of the way that, the way that we were on to report them change. Um, yeah, which Vincent's is a good thing. Real, Vincent's really good at changing things at will. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, Mapping things. Yeah. He's blast. I just want to say, and I think this is related, um, I'm just really concerned that we not, well, that in the, to put it in the positive, that we are able to meet people where they are who are not involved in this project yet or are involved in it, but don't know they're involved in it. <laughs> um, and, you know, have, data and information that exists in some form which might be simple or complex and what we're building for if we're building for the optimum environment for us doing what we wanted what we see as what we should do the world should do and like building for first contact almost, you know, with, with other, other people. And um, yeah, I just get it. I mean, I think Airtable, you know, building an Airtable is better than building in, you know, 
catalyst or factor, you know, any specific thing, but, um, but, but thinking in terms of, you know, CSV and I just, I'm just, it's a, it's a, a non-technical gut reaction to a dichotomy that I think I see. I could be completely wrong. <laughs> That's it. Go for it, Jonathan. So, um, plus one to you, Mike. Um, Stacy and I were talking yesterday about um, figuring out what people's passions are and then helping or somehow making a tool or having a human intervent, human intervene and point them without a tool to a need that matches their passion. Um, I, I've been seeing this for a vision for, I don't know, five years. Uh, the idea, and the, the idea is about um, market research, versus uh, a general global needs um, database where, you know, John Kelly needs an iPhone would be an item. And a person who has extra iPhones would somehow notice that. And, and my focus is on the somehow. Um, how, I mean, searching just doesn't do it unless you know what you're looking for. Uh, browsing doesn't do it until you climb up the learning curve of how to get the most from your browser. Um, so there's this uh, need for a way to, for people to understand how to use a needs database intelligently or easily or, I mean, super dumb people can just come in here and go, oh, yeah, there we go. I got extra iPhones. I'll give them to John Kelly. <laughs> That's a, a passion. I, I would deeply love to find people who want to work on that problem. So it's a little down the road for what we're talking about here, but... Um, I, I think it's not actually. That's that's a big reason oh. why Flotilla exists. Um, and um, uh, Catalyst is basically a have needs uh, directory, um, and it's been something I've been chasing probably at least since um, uh, 9 11, um, 9 11, and and then the beginning of the p pandemic. Um, there was just an explosion of. Um, uh, in in 911 a lot of it was uh, seeking and found rather than have a need um, but um, but there was uh, 911 was late enough that there was a lot of uh, technical capability in the world to to kind of do that sort of thing so both in 911 and um, the beginning of the pandemic uh, we just had this explosion of Google sheets is actually the way it gets done um or or it's often been done you get this explosion of google sheets and then you get an explosion of sheets that list google sheets and then you get an explosion of sheets that list sheets that list sheets and for you know for people like us it just like oh my god <laughs> you know just please everybody like point to one database instead of this like exploding tree you know a hierarchical tree they really get three four five levels deep of directories to directories to directories and then all of them are crappy you know crappy designs and stuff like that because it, it wasn't somebody who's used to doing this kind of stuff it was somebody who knows how to use google sheets a little bit and is like okay i made a google sheet of the the 10 people i know that need something and the 10 people i know that have something and you know and that sheet doesn't match the next one and so um right right with you jonathan and um this is you know it, it's a big thing that, that we do. The and um, my m one of my favorite positions in there is that um, I, I haven't seen anything better really 
um, yet than what I call matchmakers, which are people who've you know, read the equivalent of 10 or 20 or 100 different Google Sheets um, and, you know, and have spent hours doing that, literally hours you know, every day um, sometimes, um, and, and just doing the matchmaking. Um, because browsing and searching and tagging and filtering and all that kind of stuff, Vincent has done some amazing work and it feels like we're making, he's making real progress for us um, in things like mapping fields and tagging and stuff like that. Um, uh, but I, I, you know, it's going to be a long time before, um, uh, before we have things that are better than, than just literally people doing that. Um, because you end up with, uh, the, the problems that you end up with at scale kind of are, I don't even know how to, to talk about what I need. You know, I'm going to say a need in a completely different way, like a different, you know, uh, syntax and, and words and everything than the person who's got the, the have, right? Um, and it's going to end up in a completely different database even, right? And so humans are super good at pattern matching and uh, absorbing and, and retaining a bunch of uh, fuzzy information and doing um, the, the thing that humans are really good at is fuzzy matching, right? Stacy said, you know, Stacy was uh, had a, a random wish that somebody, you know, uh, could do something, you know, and then and then somebody else is like, I know that they even haven't haven't even said it, but I know they're passionate about that, and they could actually fulfill Stacy's need, and and then a matchmaker matches that, and the the information the the subtlety and the and the the structure of the information is just not something that that non information scientists are going to be able to set up the information so that a match gets made right it's it's much more how can we so this is um I um I push this really hard in Flotilla um, and I apologize a little bit for that but this isn't a this isn't a core flotilla principle, but it is a core thing for me. To our, us as toolmakers, what I, I think good directories are is uh, power tools for the matchmakers. And, and I, I have a lot of energy for making those power tools more effective for, for essentially specialists, matchmaking specialists. And I'd have a lot less energy for making them easy to use or intuitive or, or any of that stuff that helps end users uh, map, map stuff. Yeah, I'm with you. Yeah, the narrower the audience to which you build a tool, the more likely you are to actually deliver. I, it's, uh, I it's partly agree. that, and it's partly just it's a it's a specialist activity. Matchmaking is a specialist activity, and sure. most and and the whole concept of libraries and directories and stuff like that, I think, is a specialist activity. We we like to yeah. think that anybody can use the library effectively, and it's not actually true. No, it's really um, challenging. Yeah, but you know, I I just want to interject that, like, we want to make tools for librarians to find books for people, but it would be great if we're not just searching the library of books that we have already brought together, but recognizing books that somebody didn't make for our library. I, my metaphor is a little yep. stretched, but I mean, I feel like yep. we're not, it's not that we need to make it easy for everybody to use this, but along the lines of, I mean, Brad with, with you know, Twitter feeds or, or Factor with RSS feeds, there's stuff that people are doing out there that is not done for us that ideally we want to be able to parse and interact with without having to manually post it in or or enter it or like decide it's worthy or not i mean it just it seems like in in a in a, in a organic movement and an organic um 
mind space. You want to be able to like do statistical research and and kind of aggregation of stuff that exists outside your effort almost more than you want to like i i like that and, and another stuff. thing is i i don't want to bias towards professional librarians or people who've had library training some people I, have library mind and it works completely differently than professional librarians and and so another thing is the library should be set up so anybody who's clever you know, with and clever and, and thinks in some library way, um, doesn't have to have a certification in library science. Right. They just like, oh, wow, you know, I, I kind of get how this works. I can kind of jive with this and, and, you know, do jazz on top of the collection that we didn't anticipate the way that they would use it, but they, they're yeah. still brilliant with it, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm probably making the librarian matchmaker analogy was was not quite right because the matchmaker should be able to be not an untrained matchmaker a somebody who sees patterns in a different way than you know the dewey decimal system or something that you know somebody somebody knows already and only select people now yeah yeah um, <clears throat> my i raised my hand uh earlier on the notion of, because uh, I wanted to focus on the difference between a skilled person at matchmaking and somebody who just really loves the idea and has a lot of energy, which is extremely valuable and goes wasted if there's no training available for how they can learn to use a tool, which is kind of what Stacy is commenting on um, onboarding is the uh, a a word that applies to this in my mind, um, and I think onboarding is onboarding and documentation are the most neglected um, activity globally seems to me um, and if we build a tool whatever the tool is we're also going to need to supply training materials or a classroom uh, i've encountered some other groups that want to do exactly that and they, i might invite them here um, thanks Brad. Yeah, hi guys. Uh, sorry, I was I'm late enough to not probably be completely out of sync, but um, <clears throat> uh, the needs and wants thing isn't my area of expertise. I mean, I'm, I have trouble believing that somebody hasn't solved this before. Um, I know a friend of mine was working on, a, on something that was pretty much explicitly that. Um, it kind of got stalled, so I can't really offer that as a uh, as a possibility. But I would think that like the mutual aid wor uh, world is full of this stuff, aren't they? I haven't I haven't done the research, but that's what mutual aid is all about. And I would think that that stuff has become so widespread now that that uh, some tools must have been developed for that. Um, but if not, um, I guess. I mean, I agree with you, Pete, on some levels that, you know, you, you know, it's, it, you know, non-optimal initial uh, implementations can make optimal ones harder later on. But on the other hand, you know, the, the perfect is the enemy of the good. <clears throat> I, I, I think there's a middle ground. I mean, I mean, the, the thing that comes to mind is uh, a couple meetings ago when, uh, you know, I, I suggested something like, you know, that, you know, we think in terms of, of graphs of n nodes and edges and, and um, that that was a general enough way to, uh, a general enough presumption that you could, you know, kind of implement anything within it. And then Mark, Mark Antoine <laughs> said, no, <laughs> we need recursive hypergraphs. 
And, uh, you know, maybe recursive hypergraphs are the optimal way to do it, but they're a long way off. So, I mean, I think there's, I, you know, I personally, you know, I don't think it's that, if you, if you choose your, your sort of non-optimal initial uh, in, uh, implementation carefully, then you should be able to migrate to the optimal one. Um, I have a question about Airtable. I mean, is, does Airtable have APIs and stuff so that you could like say, please give this to me in JSON format or whatever? Uh, yes, uh, it has a really good API. Um, it also has really good import export. Um, so I, I totally agree with you, um, Brad, uh, the um, best is enemy of the good. Um, the, the point I'm making is actually not about one implementation, it's about what to implement first. Um, centralization, a, a cent one centralized database versus the ability to have decentralization. Mm -hmm. Two different axes. Um, and they, they actually, you know, they, um, they synergize really well. Um, and Vincent and I, and everybody here, I think, is actually pretty good at holding both of those needs so whenever Vincent, Vincent works mostly in, in centralization, but he is continually always thinking one of his top design criteria is for decentralization and uh, data mobility and stuff like that. Um, uh, can, can you reiterate the, the, your, uh, your um, elaboration on that? Because I, I, I missed it kind of. The, um, so uh, <clears throat> the, the two presenting kinds of databases, one of, one of them is about what we call projects, uh, which you might also call groups, um, uh, a, a team working on a, on a particular thing or a particular set of, uh, of sub-things, actually. So projects is one thing. Um, the one I came up with today um, and work, am working on today is, is commitments, essentially light contractual agreements um, between entities. So, um, and the dichotomy for me, uh, which keeps coming up and where Vincent and I are in, in friendly um, dialogue, uh, long-term dialogue about is um, Vincent is super good at making a centralized database that's super flexible and super wonderful. And actually the, the, uh, the superness of it is part of my problem. Um, uh, uh, I, I'm concerned that uh, we could go, you know, two or three months um, with the uh, talking about Meta Project now. Meta Project has got it's it's got right now like a few projects um, or sovereigns. Projects and sovereigns are very similar things. Um, it's got a few right now. I you know, and they're fuzzy. There's maybe five or something like that. In in a couple months, we'll have fifty or hundred or two hundred. Um, do we? Uh, and Vincent has already built most of the project database for that. Um, do we continue to just double down on using that single database, which Vincent has made very rich and flexible and multi-connectable? Um, or do we, do we, how much time and energy do we put zero, 50, 100% of our time into being able to syndicate that data between two separate implementations of a database. Um, and that would mean that we would work on, you know, is CSV good enough? Do we have to also support JSON? Uh, what if somebody comes to us with YAML and they don't have JSON or CSV? Um, uh, you know, uh, when I'm representing dates, how do I represent them? Um, do your UIDs mean the same as my UUIDs or do we need some kind of UUID um, DNS or something like that. There's, uh, so do we, do we concentrate on making a really good database and it happens to be centralized and we're promising ourselves that we're going to decentralize someday or how much energy do we put into decentralizing from the beginning? Um, by, by the way, in the olden days, I, having told this story a little bit, um, back in the days when we were developing um, uh, internet protocols, uh, so like IMAP for email um, or POP, uh, or NNTP, 
the rule was always you you have to have two separate implementations before you can really talk about it as a proposed standard the two oh, implementations have to be written separately by different people and they have to have the the coordination thing um defined so the coordination what? thing is the standard and not the not either implementation that was what i was going to get to actually and that's why i asked about the api because you know um i like graph databases i could easily see um pretty easily um working with vincent or you know uh whatever and just essentially using the Airtable api to um, synchronize a graph database representation of his projects table um because i don't i don't i i don't see yeah so i so in essence is that what is that what you're saying pete like it would like if if um if vincent has all these great projects in his air table and there's there's an interchange mechanism where i can read it into a graph database and and any changes in the graph database can write back to the air table is, is that a is, is that what you're talking about in terms of like two implementations yes uh and, and it's really tempting not to do two implementations because uh between vincent and airtable and catalyst we've got everything we need <laughs> it's wonderful um right. but that's kind of the problem too the you know it's like we, we're promising ourselves that we can have another implementation but the further along we we get with a centralized implementation the farther the, the more you know structural and technical debt um and and that we've we're accruing kind of is is where i'm going and i, I think oh. there's a threshold point past which you're in trouble but well, I, I, we're not there yet so well certainly i if i was going to if i was to use the data that's in Vincent's Airtable, I wouldn't use Airtable. I would I would spend the time to import it into a, into my graph database and then yep. work with it there. So yep. I don't I don't think there's a worry about it being, uh, you know, sort of this black hole that no one can get out of. At least not from my. That, that's not at all my worry. Okay. And and to Vincent uh, to to Jonathan's point, a, a threshold. <clears throat> I it's a it's a the the concern i have is not that it's it's not a threshold thing it's that we're going to get comfortable and complacent and so in in the case of michael's so we get a, a year down the road we've got um you know catalyst airtable stuff going everybody's happy everybody's super productive because we've got this you know database of record and then the a, a failure mode for me is kind of what Michael Gross, uh, Michael Michael said um, that first contact scenario. You know, we bump into somebody who's got a completely different way of looking at things, and then and then we go, okay, well, I get that your way is cool, but we have all this database, we all this data, we've got a hundred thousand records, kind of in this comfortable database. Let's wait for another six months to figure out how we're going to sync up with your data, right? Instead of going, oh, uh, you know, uh, we already have the interchange stuff working. Um, we'll just, you know, write write code to your your end, and we're good to go. It's, it's not a it's not a threshold thing. It's it's actually um, yeah. comfort. Um, well, then, regarding comfort, um, but how how do we gird ourselves from can you say what you need us to do peter to avoid us you know falling into that comfort hole um i so uh I, i'll try to answer that question but another thing that's going on in my head is that i think the meta project is going to run into the same problem over and over and over you know why are we federating it takes like i have to do three times as much work to get all my work done because of this federation stupid federation thing why don't we all just get together and do one project instead of the six projects right and the it's it's a lot of overhead to think about decentralizing or, or it's a lot of overhead to it's a lot of overhead to think about it it's even more overhead to to do it and implement it um and so I'm, I, another thing I'm worried about is kind of the meta lesson we're learning here. Um, and maybe that's kind of where I'm going with, you know, we're, we're trying to, I'm trying to develop a principle of 
hyperscaling and you know uh, scalability um, and fast scalability, right? So the lesson to me is super important, which I guess is why I keep bringing it up. So to answer your question, Jonathan, I now I remember in the olden days, um, uh, I especially remember IMAP, but there were a bunch of protocols, FTP or SMTP or NNTP or Telnet. Um, uh, the the rule um, uh, gui guideline, it was essentially a rule. The rule is, I don't even care about hearing about your protocol until you've got two separate implementations written by different people, written from different you know points of view, and they're they're talking to each other. So in the olden days, um, we didn't talk. We we the the centralization decentralization. Um, pendulum, you know, swings back and forth. The early implementation of the internet was all about decentralization. Uh, you've got uh, USC on one hand, and you've got UMN on the other hand, and you've got uh, SRI, you know, and the thing that you were inventing wasn't a centralized database or message store or whatever. The thing you were inventing was how to get it across the wire, right? So protocols were across the wire things. They were never implementations. We have saw, swung really far back. Now everybody thinks in centralization, right? Why would I do anything except Google Drive? Why would I do anything except Facebook? Um, so it, it's hard to even conceptualize the fact that the thing that you want to build, I don't, I don't really care how you implement it. All I care about is how you connect it to other implementations, right? So. Um, and it's not an either or thing. You need a combination of centralization and decentralization to get anything done um, or a hierarchy and, and whatever. Um, uh, so I'm not arguing for an either or. It's, it's kind of like, where are we about, putting energy? Um, where I mean, are we putting bias? Just, yeah? Why not just agree uh, right away that to um, prioritize writing a simple app for hitting the Airtable database and returning yeah. JSON. I mean, yeah, that's that's kind of what I guess I'm arguing for. Yeah. Yeah, I mean that's not hard. I mean, uh, it's it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't think. Um, to to put my other hat on to you know to argue the 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 opposite, it's it's literally a waste of time, right? Um, it's like. All the Why? you know everything that we, all the functionality we need is in Airtable and Catalyst. No, but I mean, you if, if if your contention that if nothing's worth doing unless we have an interchange format, then it's not a waste of time, right? It's just our first interchange format. Um, but I guess that's what I'm arguing for. Yeah. Right? Okay. So it's not a waste of time. I'm very unclear about what you are focusing on yep. in terms of your alternative. I get the sense that there's CSV versus um, XML versus, you know, whatever. Um, also, the names of the fields are going to matter if you want the recipient to recognize the data you're sending them. Um, is there something beyond that that you're talking about? Or is if that's it, it seems to me we could write a proposal based on what Vincent already has and then call that the thing we're working on. Hey, uh, that's, that's pretty close. Uh, even better would be what Brad suggested, just have another implementation that talks to Vincent's. An implementation of what? A Good UI? question. I don't know. <laughs> a, vis a visual? A reference. I, I, what I'm thinking is a reference implementation of an interchange. So, so there's a somebody writes a, a you know a, a simple app that um, hits the Airtable API uh, with you know whatever query parameters you want and returns JSON. And that's I see that as kind of the interchange. And then I could write something that consumes that to pull it into my graph database. And, uh, and then you have basically, and, and sync it up. Um, 
and then then you have two implementations that are sharing the same data. Yeah, um, yeah, that that's oh, really helpful, Brad. And I don't know if I'm if I'm technically understanding this, but I mean, are we? I guess what I'm naively perhaps imagining is like you know there there's there's a bunch of stuff going on in you know some mastodon instance where they're like saving lots of stuff and then they're and brad's doing you know people are doing on new networks what they're doing and and true is doing what it's doing and catalyst is doing what it's doing and and there there are all kinds of people with with expertise that is relevant and we're trying to while you know vincent is and and you know those of us who are on catalyst are contributing to this instance of this kind of information our um i'm forgetting brad's word now but our our um You know, maybe it's in, in JSON. Maybe it, there, there's there's something that can be contributed to, um, or allows other other platforms, other groups to draw from our information for us to um, draw from their information without having to translate absolutely everything they're doing. It's in some common format. But that's a question. <laughs> um, like, well, that's, hey. it's, it's, it's the common format that's really the, the key because if, right. if yeah. everybody agrees, it's, okay, we're gonna, we have a schema for, for a project and, and here's the JSON rendering of that schema then if everybody just works with that then then there is no translation that has to be done i mean right. i mean the the question i have i guess is is does it take the thing about csv and and you know uh markup is that like we're not promulgating them we're defaulting to them and they exist and you know other stuff in other places from from people that we want to participate who we're going to have first contact with um they've already got it probably in in a way that speaks to speaks a common language to us and I don't know. Um, okay, I hear. Yeah, I hear that. Um, and and I, two things about that. One is, then you just make you just do a one-time translation from the interchange format to those, and then you, and then you, then there's no translation necessary. The, the the thing is, if you've got twenty different ways of represented, or even three, you don't want to have to write a converter from each one to each one. You want to you want to have a some agreed upon center. And then, the, then all you have to do is do you know a to you know x to a, x to b, x to c. You don't have to do x a b c. You know, um, so and, and you know if if people really want to stick with CSS, although CB, CSV, I understand that. But and then you write a JSON to CSV converter, and and then they're good to go. Um, there's there's kind of two things here. One of them is you know is it CSV or JSON or or YAML or XML? Um, the well, you mean the inter the, the the central interchange format? Is, well, is, one one thing is is just the data format, right? Um, the the place where it gets and and that's one thing of, of interest. And I'm I'm actually interested in pushing CSV for we can get into that later, but. The data format is not the interesting part of this discussion for me. It's actually the schema. Um, so the and the interesting thing that will happen is take commitments, for instance. Um, uh, Jordan and I and 
some of the folks in Meta Project have got a pretty, you know, we've we've thought a lot about what commitments are and what how they work and and what you use them for. They're similar to contracts, actually. The high-level summary of a contract is, you know, company X uh, promises to deliver 100 widgets to company Y um, uh, upon payment, right? So con a contract and a commitment are fairly similar things. I happen to know about contracts. So as I'm designing the commitments, I might also design it so that you could take the top level export of a contracts database and they'll map. But what if I didn't know about contracts? So here I am going along with commitments and and then we have first contact with somebody who's mapping something very similar, but also very different, right? And so we have to we have to do actually what Vincent does all the time. Uh, he bumps into additional databases and he says, oh, they think of an organization in this way. I think of it in this way. That one thinks about this other way. Vincent is really good at kind of coming up with a superset of those things and saying, um, I can map all of those things pretty well. We're going to have to keep doing that over and over, right? Um, and I think um, even though Vincent um, uh, Vincent is awesome, and uh, we we are um, we are blessed to have him in our life. He can't. I don't think he can be the only one who's bumping into these first contact situations and resolving them for the entire network, right? So. Um, so the, the real interesting thing is I've been publishing organizations or I've been publishing projects or I've been publishing commitments and then I bump into something that kind of maps to it and then we have to, you know, each, each side um, or in the middle, we have to create an interchange format or cre create translations on each side or we have to adapt the schemas on one side or the other side and that schema adaptation is a learning process and a collaboration process and and it can be painful or or easy um depending so um the, the the big brad thank you a lot that so in my head the dichotomy was do we work on interchange protocol interchange schema essentially interchange schema or do we work on a centralized database and to, to recommend, um, <laughs> thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'll keep trying to explain or, or something. The, the, the recommendation that's like, oh, you need actually a, a reference, another reference implementation that speaks the protocol. That's, that's what I was missing. Um, and that's the useful carry away, uh, takeaway for me. But, that I need to think of it, an implementation rather than abstract uh, so interchange. I'm, I'm stuck on gee that doesn't sound like it's offering anything different than here's vincent's schema and it's going to change with time and we need to make sure we don't get too complacent that we stop changing it i, I just don't see what you're asking us to open our minds to there's, there's a difference, it's it's the difference between, and this over -dram dramatizes it um, because Vincent is anything but insular, but it's the difference between one person imagining an interaction with another person and saying, well, then they're gonna say that, and then I'll have this response. When you actually meet somebody and you have an interaction with them, they surprise you continually, right? Oh, I'd never thought of it that way. Oh, wow. You're saying things I hadn't predicted. Oh, wow. So that's what it is. You, you end up in these, mm -hmm. you know, until you have a conversation with somebody else, uh, you, you don't bump into the surprises that you will have in a conversation with somebody else. And so essentially I'm arguing that we should have two people in conversation rather than one person talking to themselves. And I'm again, I'm over dramatizing it. Vincent does this all the time. He's really good at, at jumping over and saying, I'm going to grab this person and bring them into my conversation and I'm going to expand my consciousness to include theirs. But that's partly Vincent's superpower. And still, it's partly also, you know, in, in one place, it's ending up in one database that, that is super comfortable and super friendly and super fun to use. Um, but it's different than having two separate implementations 
collaborating and, and competing with each other for, you know, what, how do we make an understanding that, that works for both of us? You should go for it, Vincent. Okay, so I think we agreed upon using Airtable for the meta project, correct? For its, you know, ability to do like importing and exporting lots of different formats and other regions. I think, I, I, f I feel like the conversation has been a bit, um, I don't think it's getting at what the actual issue is, because I think we all are in agreement that we need to focus on having um, decentralization and interoperability. Um, yeah, I, I feel a bit alone in, um, like with, you know, the database I shared, which Brad, I think you missed at the beginning um, of the like different organizations. Like I figured out how to, from Airtable, import to Catalyst and then from Catalyst import from JSON to go to Kumu. So I've created like three implementations of the same data set and just to prove that it's like possible, but like almost without it even being asked for, um, I just feel like we don't actually have any databases that are worth getting into conversations with people about. Um, like, like I have about uh, 50 project databases that have less than 15 records in them in Airtable. And I feel like it's not worth creating another one before we get one database that's like, I guess like juicy enough that someone actually wants to get into a conversation about, hey, I actually really want to use this data in my application. So I think we like we should start from decentralization from the beginning, but I think the beginning is having something tangible to actually um, be able to do like, like you know, I was uh, working with Jonathan to uh, um, try to, you had to like base encode the data to send it to Kumu. So I just sent nothing. Um, it's really easy to translate, <laughs> to encode data if it's just nothing, because the encoding of nothing is nothing. And I feel like we're trying to like translate nothing to nothing, like not saying anything in English also doesn't say anything in a different language. So I think we need actual like words, like we need actual data and we need to like, I think get far enough in one centralized database, centralized, like my definition is like a list of like 50 projects that like all the fields are filled out to the point where we can actually start experimenting. I just think that is the beginning that we start doing the decentralization or else we don't really have any meat to translate. And so I'm just curious about what the, what the criteria is for a database to be getting too big that we should split it off. And my argument is like, we shouldn't create another project database than the map weavers for just meta project yet because the whole point of the map weavers database was to create a database for meta projects. So like creating them separate without having finished the one that we wanted to create initially seems like it's a waste of our time and energy, um, especially since we're all doing this in a way that we all know is going to be interoperable. Right, well then I, I, I have a sort of a, a modest proposal uh, let's see. So, uh, you know, I feel strongly enough about graph databases in terms of their, their utility that I'm willing to do the, the, that side of the, of an interchange, uh, experiment. If somebody wants to write the, write a, um, an API on, uh, Airtable that, that takes a simple query, like give me all the projects in this geographical region or with which match this, ter this, this term in their title uh, and gives me back JSON, uh, then I'll read that into, a, you know, I'll, I'll do the part of reading it into a graph database. And Pete, if, if you wanna, I, I would love to kind of collaborate with you on, it's, it's pretty damn, damn easy. Uh, then we could have, then, then we would, and, and the thing is, uh, Vincent, I don't see it as, as, you know, the database getting too big or whatever. It's really just, you know, interoperability. Um, so Pete, if you're interested, well, I can, I can do it myself, but um, in my copious spare time, but, um, but if I had that, you know, if I had a way of hitting 
getting JSON, then you know bringing it into and out of a graph database would be pretty straightforward, I think. Uh, there's a question on the on your project. Do Before you, have... you get into that, Brad, uh -huh. um, I think Vincent already has Kumu, and I have seriously that is taking his data and putting it into a graph. So is that think... using the is that using the the Airtable API or how is that being done? Um, it, it's it's more crude at this point. I, That's my I, point. That's my point. Is that is that if you uh, if you did the part of actually doing the JSON export, then the Kumu integration, the seriously integration, the graph database implementation integration would all be able to do take the same use the same code. Uh, you mean uh, this this the same data. Uh, anyway, same go. Data. But, Sorry, but keep going, Jonathan. I mean, well, I, I'm, I'm kind of thinking we're all talking about something that already exists. Well, but, well, I guess what I'm asking is, is there an, is there an API endpoint that I could hit that would get, allow me to read the projects table, given a couple query items? Yes. There is. Yeah. Uh, Air, Air, for Airtable, yeah. Airtable API is really nice. Um, I happen to use it in Python, um, and I think it's actually a third-party library that, that does it. But they have uh, like three reference implementations. Oh, OK. That, you know... Well, then, well, shoot me that. Maybe, we're, maybe, maybe it does already exist, as you say, Jonathan. The, the API is, yeah, the API is really straightforward. Um, I think a, a thing that doesn't quite exist, Jonathan, and, and the thing that I'm I'm pushing for is uh, diversity of implementation. Um, so, like Vincent said, he's got you know what? Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, da visual? databases, databases. No, um, like air tables. Do you mean though, Pete? Like having like my comment, which initially started this conversation, was we should have multiple one air table per sovereign. Like, is that what you would consider like a different implementation? Did I thought you wanted to do one base for all the sovereigns. Yeah, that's what Vincent wants. Um, no, just one base per cluster of sovereigns when there's one person managing the data. Like I think meta one, one yeah, yeah, one one base per um, project manager essentially. Because it sounds like what Only you're talking in... about, Peter, is a schema that uh, is known to is known widely. A, a good example, and, and it's also a bad example, but a good example is uh, if we were representing um, the, the projects table um, from the Mapweavers base in Massive Wiki. So when, when I talk about a different implementation, I'm talking about a different system, so not Airtable. Um, or maybe a, a different way to think of it is Vincent's already kind of done this with Kumu, actually, but um, uh, Airtable isn't really a, a graph database, but Vincent's got some stuff on top of it that turns the data into a, a graph. If you represent that in, in, a, in a graph database like Neo4j, um, that's, that would be a different implementation. So, and the, the thing that I'm looking for is the diversity of kind of opinions about the shape of the data, right? Massive Wiki is going to think of the data in a projects database much differently and represent it differently than Airtable is going to. And so that diversity of opinions about how, you know, how to represent a project on a page versus how to represent a project on a row in Airtable um, is the, the conversation I'm looking for. I, to come back to Vincent's point, I, I, he's, he's got a great point. We don't have enough freaking data that it, that it actually even matters. Um, and uh, I, I think I have a little bit of a, I would say the Airtable thing a little bit differently, Vincent. I, I think we've ag agreed generally in the Meta Project to use Airtable for convenience, basically, um, for a while until, it, until we run out of steam with it. But um, uh, the, the other part of it, uh, I, I, the, a thing I don't know that we've all agreed on, but I think is important is that sovereigns talk in, 
uh, API form and not uh, and and not shared databases in general. I mean, it's fine if they share databases, um, so, yeah, yeah. but um, the sovereigns need to be talking to an API so that anybody can say, well, I'm not going to use Airtable, I'm going to use Asana, or I'm not going to use Asana, I'm going to use Neo4j, or I'm not going to use Neo4j, I'm going to use um, uh, Freebase or whatever. Um, and and that should be awesome. Um, but but I, I think we should I think we should fill up one project database with 50 projects before we worry too much about about how we interchange them. Conversely, I think with the commitments, I think I'm going to be publishing I, I the uh, Jordan yes Jordan and I yesterday Jordan had a really simple plea. It's like please can we just start you know publishing commitments to each other essentially is what he said um and you know it's like and pete what's the mvp for that and and my first thought is well that's an air table and well actually if it's an air table then it should be a table on the map weavers uh, base and you know and then a concern i don't think i've articulated well enough is that another artifact another another outcome of the way that we're designing things is that everything we're designing is, is being designed by people who are good at Airtable. Um, so, uh, so if I go to Kilu and Wendy E and say, hey, could you guys start publishing your commitments to each other? The thing I kind of want to have happen is for that to be a first contact with a different way of representing commitments rather than a set of technologists coming to them with a schema. I really want to see how Kilo and Wendy E are going to talk about commitments and to, to each other and to the rest of the world and not bias them towards learning a, you know, a way that we think we should do it. Rather, I want to see how they're going to do it. And I think it's going to be different, and and you know that that diversity is is something I really want to look for. And so so anyway, I think with projects, projects are well understood, reasonably well understood by most people. There's tons, thousands of project management and product management and and uh, books and and things like that. The the schema that we've got is pretty pretty solid. For commitments, I feel like that's different, and I I would rather actually publish commitments more free form to start and probably I actually I, I screwed up and even showing that schema um, uh, because now I've infected all of you with oh yeah it's just an Airtable base and it's got the classic fields that we would expect um, a much more rich and interesting thing is is for me to go to RFG and say let's start talking about the way that we make commitments to each other and you know could you start um, uh, talking about the commitments that you're making interpersonally and inter-sovereignly. I'm struggling here because um, when you talk about uh, API or you're talking about a schema, the, that's those are conceptually familiar to a narrow band of people. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, uh, for me, the missing people is providing the translation from people who aren't in that band um, to being able to interact. And for me, that's always done through some kind of tool that's built on top of the API or the database. Um, the, 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 the thing, I, I would like us to do better is so so one of the things I do I have I found that I do and thank you Stacy is um, I talk in metaphors from my past right so I have a, a startup startup slash MBA slash business kind of way of talking sales product marketing I've got a product development way of talking uh, you know product managers uh, use use stories uh, personas um, uh, I've got a, a database, you know, way of talking schemas, APIs, uh, that kind of stuff. So, 
um, I think that's all good. And um, a thing that we want to watch for is um, when I say two sovereigns should have a schema that they use to, to communicate commitments, or actually all the sovereigns should use the same schema to communicate commitments through an API-like interface that makes a lot of sense to that band of people who are used to exchanging data right but that that worldview the the people who have that worldview have a a a, a bunch of preconceptions about the things that fit into an api and the, the things that fit into a schema and and it's really easy for all of us to fall into, you know, oh, tell me what you're trying to communicate. It's a commitment. Oh, you have a name, a short name and description, uh, start date and end date. And, you know, you just rattle them off. Um, I finally get what you're talking about. That's so easy and so encapsulated that I can't, it's hard for me to even think about anything else, right? I'm, I'm, I know that when we talk to, you know, and it's happened to me actually. Wendy, uh, Wendy Elford, and David Bovel, and me, um, each of us speaking English, each of us from pretty much the same culture, um, started making commitments and agreements with each other, and it blew apart because um, David has a, a, a English understanding of what commitments are, and Wendy has an Australian one, and I have a Californian one, and even though we were speaking the same language, when we started to try to make commitments to each other and with time zones and stuff adding noise to the thing it was like i thought you meant i should do xyz and and it, you know it turns out you're you meant me to do abc and all of that kind of rich misunderstanding and and coming to agreements um about you know what i committed to and how i committed to it um if we jump too soon to, oh, all you have to do is put this in, you know, a Google Sheet or a CSV or JSON or whatever, if we jump too soon to that, I think we will have missed a bunch of richer and more complex and more interesting and, and more important ways of representing it. So there, there are two traps that I hear you describe. One is a terminology mismatch, and the other is, um, this information doesn't fit your schema, so I'm going to drop it on the floor, and that's a loss. Kind of, kind of a conceptual mis mis mismatch, and also a blind spot that we in society have had for, you know, 60 years, because anybody who's managing data has 60 years of of kind of this is the way that you manage data behind them, and there's the rest of humanity that that talks in stories and you know and qualitative promises rather than quantitative promises and things like that that you know that we've we need to figure out how to represent right and not squash on not squash them in the act of asking them you know it, it reminds me now it it's like mm -hmm. uh like um uh, like in the 16 and 1700s, uh, European uh, explorers and then settlers coming over and saying, oh, I totally get what you guys are doing. You're doing, and all the, all the, the colonizers could, could even think of was the things that they had learned from their homes, right? So the people they, they were invading had different ways of thinking about nature and about life and about ecology and stuff like that. And all of that just got lost because you know, it's like, well, we're going to use my language and my language is the best language. And, you know, so that's kind of, I, I want to make sure that we don't have that happen as, as we bring technology into, you know, a billion people trying to make the world a better place. So I hear, I hear you saying, hey, we should watch out for blah. Um, and I agree. I, and I've thought that way for a lot, a while. So it's nothing new. What what I'm wondering is, do you have a solution? Or are you just saying, we need to think up of a solution? I, I don't, I, and I'm not even sure. I, I just want mm. us to think about it. Um, okay. the, the, the flip side of it is, I'm pretty sure that the, the urgency that I hear from people working in the Meta Project is, 
we have to move fast. We have to be, you know, like working at scale in three or four or five years and working at huge scale in, in 10 or 15 years. And I know that to do that, we need to do to use coordination technology and the coordination technologists, coordination technologists are going to just just to get it done in that amount of time. Smash we're going it. to yeah it, it's gonna you know end up with a lot of lossy you know lossy loss of culture um but i like want to make the sure the american that, that indians we, yeah yeah i, I want to make sure that we're at least thinking about that as we lose culture and and you know and 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 try to do things um differently also okay I'm into it. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think we're all into it. This is a good crew. And Vincent, I feel your your shout out for please help me. Um, I'm keen to learn what you do. And I, if, if I can wrap my brain around it, I'll join you and be a, a clone of Vincent or the Jonathan Sand version. Because, <laughs> yeah, being the only guy in the hot seat is, is not a life to look forward to. Yeah. yeah, like room for two <laughs> or more. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but the the thing, that Vincent, my hat is is you've never seen me wear a hat because it's always off to you. But um, uh, just you know, we're not gonna be able to be to do what you do, um, and and yet you know there are also we have to realize many others who aren't part of this group who are out there doing things like what you do and and not not that they're as good um but you know that um yeah I, I guess i guess kind of coming back to the 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 question i was asking in text you know like how um yeah how we how we take advantage i mean right now you know we have this small universe in which you're the only one doing what you do um and how do we make it so that we are including the other not universe, you know, galaxies that have their own only one person doing what they do. And, you know, we're not, you know, what, what, whether we have more people supporting you and making it easier for you to do what you do in this galaxy, um, I'm more concerned with how we interface with other galaxies. So finding the other people out there are not not more of us in here. Yeah. I wish I had the answer. <laughs> I, I feel um, like recently I've come into contact with a lot of other groups and people that are very keen on mapping. And it seems like there's a pattern of um, the maps that get done that you see are the ones that had someone or a majority of people to say, like, we just need to do it, <laughs> even though it's not going to be perfect. And it's not going to be interoperable. It's kind of like a, it's a weird like um, bias where it's like all the things that have like got to a point where you see them are the ones that had to sacrifice something at some point. Um, and so a lot of the maps you see are not like interoperable because they are out there in the world now. And the ones that are working really hard to be interoperable take longer, so they lag behind. 
So yeah, how do we like balance both of those is really hard. Um, but yeah, for me, I definitely um, think the meta project in general, like by in, in our current, um, like phase one, the first sprint or first cycle, I feel like we probably could be more on the side of action because at the size we're at, it's more forgiving to fail now. Um, and I think maybe by the third cycle, when it, you know, if it's going to double each cycle, um, like I almost want to do more of the radical experimenting and prototyping and failing quickly in the beginning, because it's a bit more forgive, forgiving than when you're at millions of people. Um, and I think, unfortunately, the only way you like learn some of those mistakes is by just doing it and seeing what happens. Um, so yeah, that that's what I feel like would be really helpful for me. And I think would also bring other people in because they'll start to see something and then they'll start to say, mm, I can help this because I see something that could be made better. And that's what drew me into like a lot of these communities is like seeing, you know, like OGM on YouTube, all these incredible people. And then seeing like, wait a minute, there's something that I might be able to help with here where, you know, in terms of helping coordinate all the incredible minds. So that was like what initially kind of drew me in is, and I think we can do the same for others by putting ourselves out there a bit. And that will attract people towards our circles that have the skills to help because they're like, oh, I see where they have something that isn't 100% working and I can help. Yeah, I just want to add, I agree with what you're saying, Vincent, you know, from the level of my understanding. And I just want to just remind everybody that there's so much more happening as you're doing whatever work you're doing that isn't reflected in a product. And, you know, yeah, so keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> Um, the commitments thing that has been our uh, straw man um, concept um, figures into uh, Jordan's, you know, need database or whatever, which fits into um, kind of a evolution of what we can do with the needs database after the needs are filled uh, because some of those needs are about designing something or building something complicated and it, to my point of training the needs beta database could with the addition of explanatory and training material become a knowledge base that's useful for a long time afterwards. Um, and yeah, I, I know I'm piling a lot of baggage on the camel, but um, I, it seems to me that as to, to my point earlier that globally, we don't do a good job of uh, building usable easily navigable knowledge databases, that uh, that's a thing that we could tackle early on in the meta project so that as it scales up to a million people, we have lots of material already available and uh, created when we're most familiar with the material we're trying to describe and train people to use. The, the having, uh, so interestingly, Meta Project and Jordan don't really have the concept of, uh, I call them having needs. Um, could, you actually want both tables, right? Yep. Um, uh, uh, Meta Project doesn't really have the concept of needing that yet. And instead, uh, what Jordan has got for me is um, <laughs> uh, what Jordan has got for me. Instead of uh, the, a, a needs database, is kind of not the word I would use, maybe, but 
Um, it's uh, something that I borrowed from Jerry, which is the mosaic. Uh, mosaics ha a mosaic has tiles um, and different tiles have different things. Like uh, there might be an onboarding tile and there might be a publications tile. Um, uh, and then in the publications tile, there's separate tiles maybe for um, uh, teaching journalism, doing journalism, uh, teaching publication, uh, creating uh, beautiful websites, that kind of stuff. So those are both OGM and, um, and Meta Project have that concept of, it's almost not a needs database. It's more like a functional map of the things that need to get done to make the world a better place, right? Um, so I, there's the soil health tile, which is inside the ecology tile or whatever, which is, you know, and you can overlay that with SDGs or, or stuff from the tapestry or whatever. Um, I think, I, I think uh, uh, you said something interesting, which is it would be nice to have easier to use databases and directories. And, and I, I just don't have that. It, it, again, it's, I, I want a high performance tool that specialists can use and that people who are natively good but aren't yet specialists can grow into. Um, I don't care too much if they're easy to use. I care a lot more that they're powerful. Um, and there's a real there's a real tension between a powerful tool and an easy to use tool. And you know, directories are just not a good place for easy to use because it's kind of observationally impossible. Um, yeah, they they scale way beyond our capacity to navigate. the 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 exception, by the way, are things like Google. Um, Google is using a, a ton of harvested human sense making and also a ton of really sophisticated AI to make it so that they can match make your need um, and you know a, a bunch of potential um, haves for that. You know you're looking for information or a car wash, place to do car washes, or you're looking for friends or whatever. It pretty Google is pretty good at at so the, another part of my, that when I say there's specialists and non-specialists who need access to data and the non-specialists generally need to work with a, a good specialist to get good access to the data. Um, another part of that is that specialists and non-specialists talk conversationally in narrative and English and human expression. And then the specialist uses fancy, you know, fancy query languages and, and um, co conceptual understandings of, of how to map, you know, schemas and things like that to actually do the work. Th those complex schemas and, and query languages and stuff like that are not something that you want to expose non-specialists to. Um, and then conversation, human conversation is how most people work. So Google has actually wedged in there the ability to be conversational with you. So the reason Google works is because I can go to it and I can express something in fuzzy human style conversation language. And it maps that through machine learning and um, human knowledge maps um, to, you know, the, to what I actually need. So it's pretending to be, it's, it's doing a pretty good job of pretending to be human and listening to you. So I, that's an example of, of something that is technically possible and also kind of um, infeasible unless you're at the scale of Google. So um, not that it's impossible technologically, but it's, it is, um, you know, a trillion dollar effort, half trillion dollar effort. Yeah, the, your statements are very pragmatic and sensible. Um, I just get the sense that you're now creating um, a, a need for people to find those specialists and to afford to pay for their time. And um, it does, I, it, it's, it's practical, it's sensible. And I'm one of those people that still needs to find a specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. so... It, yeah, it serves the specialists. That's great, and it gives the specialists a built-in job market. But 
the, the, the thing I worry about is it's easy as technologists and people who are, are specialists at information retrieval, for instance, to think that that's a, it's a superpower that each of us here has. Mm -hmm. It's not a superpower that most people have. And so just practically, you know, there's, there's no way around that. So right. as technologists, I, I think I, my personal opinion is that we should strive to make power tools that are really good for people who are specialists and people who can learn to be specialists, be, be trained by meta specialists to be specialists, right? So then um, uh, you're speaking into an interesting thing. You know, I, I have to pay a specialist or I have to find a specialist. Um, obviously, there's going to be a meta specialist directory of specialists and a, a meta meta one where you, you talk to somebody uh, like most of the people here and say, so what kind of specialist do I need to find this, you know, find out this? Um, uh, the, we've, we've got a, a hole in the, the architecture where um, you know, value exchange and the, I, I don't think of that as job security for specialists. I think of it as empowering the network to be able to get more information to the right people at the right time. So yes, I totally agree that there's value exchange that goes on there. Um, and, and we have to develop all of that. Um, but I don't think it's a bad thing and I don't think it's, you know, a failure yeah. mode or anything like that. And I want to be careful that I'm not positioning my, myself in opposition to you. I just come from uh, the notion that people who don't like technology shouldn't be forgotten about. That some effort. I, should... We we um, we uh, <laughs> hardcore agree on that. And that then that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know. Um, uh, so hmm. I don't think you can make complicated technology easy for people who don't like technology. That's my, my message. And, and so do. you meet, I had, so right on. <laughs> um, so I think, um, uh, and I'm not, I'm not trying to disagree with you. I think that you need to make complicated technology powerful for specialists. Yes. And you have to enable specialists and non-specialists to be able to find each other and work together yes. to, um, to use the complicated technology at, at, uh, at, you know, at second hand. Right. And, and I have followed my instinct and built a, a CAD program for people who don't like computers. And it was, uh, loved um and it gives me some confidence and i think you're right you're exactly right we need powerful tools that give people who have that mindset you know just superpowers beyond their existing superpowers this is a good thing this is what technology can do for us but also computer is a powerful tool and then it can be programmed to do amazingly powerful things with very simple simple interfaces it's just an optimism that i feel in my bones and tend to pursue and i think you and i together can build you know each of these perspectives can build a amazing set of tools for people. And I don't think I'd be building the same tool as you at all. We might build exactly the same thing. Yeah, we might. <laughs> um, Stacy, you've been raising your hand for a while. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is on point, but I still just want to share this idea. Um, so right now, um, I've been so there's somebody that I, so as a matchmaker, there's somebody that I see in the video that I absolutely know I want to bring this information to the group, whether it be to Vincent or whatever. Right now, what I have to do is I have to look and I have to think, who do I know in that organization that could help me figure out how to reach that person? Whereas if I could just click on that person and get their email address because they're in a group of friends that I know, that would be enormously helpful. Or if I couldn't do that, if I could just click and get the clip 
so that somebody in my network can find that. I mean, to me, I, I don't know. It doesn't sound like a very hard thing to do, but it would be amazingly helpful to regular people. <laughs> I don't disagree. Well, except for the hard part. <laughs> it sounds hard. <laughs> Is it hard? I mean, I, see, again, I, I don't understand what you do, but I'm thinking how hard can it be whoever whoever's hosting the Zoom has all that information. They know who's everybody's email is. Like, so why is that hard? <laughs> um, uh, assuming should... permission, assuming permission. Why would that be hard? Well, the, to first order, if somebody who's running the Zoom doesn't necessarily know the email addresses of everyone. Um, no, but the computer does is what I'm saying. The computer does, yeah. But Zoom won't tell us. Oh, is think. it? There's like an information asynchrony with both the, <laughs> the platform and us, and then also certain people in a network, which is why like, oh, okay, like if I need to talk to someone in OGM, I don't know their email, I ask Jerry. There's a, Jerry's brain gives him an information um, asynchrony over people who don't have a system like that. Um, and if you're the one who sends out the calendar invites, right, there's, yeah, there's like an asynchrony there. I'll see you at the next call, taking a break. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Very I, have, I have to go too, but wow. Yeah, I probably Exciting. do too. Yeah, good call, folks. Thank you. It was very, very interesting. And uh, I like the Kumu bit very much. The Kumu thing was I, awesome. Vincent, I think, I think Vincent, that, and that really shows a way of going meta there because you can play with this scheme there. So yeah. I think that, 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 yeah, that, thanks, that, that, Gary. Thanks, Gary. I did put that link in that video. I would really recommend you to, to check it out because it's a radical new way of thinking. It basically says, why do we do APIs as such? Why can't we just use HTML as the exchange format? It's even, it's great because it's got its own way of rendering. It's already in a form that can be programmed. Uh, okay, people didn't pick up on that, but that's a really- I, I like fight. that, yeah. Um, that reminds me of microformats. Microformats is a little bit like that. Yeah, but the, the great thing about it that you can actually make it even easier. You know, once you get yeah. that, why, why don't why, why do we why because then it makes the the whole 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 uh, in a way anything you can scrape is already a data exchange yep. really yep. i mean write a scraper you can turn it into whatever data you like you already have to share it in an exact in a form that is that is a so anyhow that that i Thanks, throw Jerry. in that idea because this, this, because that, that actually makes the onboarding easier. Because we're really shooting ourselves in the foot. You don't need databases, actually. The network yeah. is the database. So yeah. you're just heading the wrong way. But anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs> I got to run to the next meeting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Bye -bye. Cheers, all. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.